We've uh, broken, loved ones, for a few weeks from the study of Romans to talk together a little about the Holy Spirit and the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And last Sunday, you remember, we talked about those moments which I think all of us have experienced at some time or another when we just don't think it's worth going on. That's about how we feel. We just don't think it's worth going on. And those moments can come after we've lost a job. But strangely enough, they can also come after the house is paid for and the children grown up or after some professional or academic goal has been achieved. We end up sitting there at home And we think, well, there must be a good reason for going on, but I can't quite think of one at the moment. And I think all of us, you know, know that feeling. And it seems to come when all our own goals have been either knocked out of us or have been achieved. And we suddenly wonder, well, what should we do next? Or why should we go on doing anything next? And usually we try to pull ourselves out of it, you know. We try to lift ourselves out of the indolence or lift ourselves out of the depression by pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps. That's really it. And you know what we do. We... We try to set some other goal, you know, some pleasure goal or some new professional goal or some new domestic goal because we've been taught since we were children, you need goals, you need goals, and that's what keeps you going. And we've been told that unless you have something to aim at, there'll be no point in life. You'll just sink into nothingness. And so we manfully or womanfully get up there and We bravely set another goal and we head out after that new goal. But inside we have a feeling that this is a purely temporary thing. It's kind of futile. What's the purpose of it anyway? We'll run out of gas before we get to it. Or when we get to it, we'll find it wasn't worth achieving in the end. Or that it's purely a passing thing. And deep, deep down, we all feel there's a vacuum there, there's a lack of drive deep down within us, an emptiness that exists in every human being on the earth. And loved ones, it does. It's just there. Because the fact is, we weren't made self-dependent autonomous entities who could direct our own self-sufficient lives. We weren't loved ones. We're abjectly, utterly dependent on whoever keeps this earth in orbit, whoever keeps the protons and the neutrons spinning round, whoever keeps the old heart ticking, whoever keeps the earth at a constant distance from the burning heat of the sun. We're abjectly dependent on that being, whoever or whatever he or it is. And it's obvious to all of us, we are not self-dependent creatures. And that's why we have such trouble, you know, keeping ourselves going. We're really... Almost in the same situation as the little dewdrops and the little daffodils, you know. If if they had uh, some built-in program, they'd just whoosh, wither, you know, and fall and drop. And we're really in the same boat. We're made by the same Creator who made us not to decide what our own purpose was going to be, not to find a purpose, but for a definite purpose. He made us for a definite purpose. And he has provided a dynamic that will keep us going, not in that manic way, you know, that we ourselves can keep going, that manic drive that keeps us going for money or success or for happiness. But this dynamic can keep us going gently and beautifully as a sailboat simply skims across the surface of a lake. So this dynamic that the Creator has provided for us 
fills the emptiness and the vacuum inside our lives. So that when we come to those moments when we're sitting on our own, the last child has been married, the last payment has been made on the mortgage, we've at last got onto the faculty. Those moments when the goals that are purely temporary seem achieved, we find there's a life within us that still is filled with purpose and that gives us a sense that we're going somewhere and directs us what direction we should head out in. And that dynamic, loved ones, is not an overwhelming force to which we submit as robots. It isn't, really. That dynamic is a dear person that the Creator has made available to all of us with whom we can cooperate You can cooperate or you can refuse to cooperate. But it is not an overwhelming dominating force to which you respond as a robot. It's a dear person, a dear friend whom you can cooperate with, who will suggest to you moment by moment in your life, head out in this direction. You can either head out or you can refuse. And that dear person is the Holy Spirit. And loved ones, that's the whole reason Jesus had for coming here to earth. You remember that old John the Baptist said to his disciples, do you see that man? And he pointed to Jesus. Well, I am not the Messiah, but the father of the whole world told me that he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain like a dove. He it is who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And John said, that man there will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus himself gathered the disciples together in Jerusalem. And it's recorded in Acts 1 and 4. He charged them, wait in Jerusalem until you've received the promise of the Father, which will come to you. Because John baptized you with water, but there is one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And that one, of course, was himself. And the whole purpose of Jesus coming to earth at all was to baptize us with this Holy Spirit. And loved ones... You may say, well, why could we not have been baptized with the Holy Spirit before Jesus came? Loved ones, because of our own self-oriented personalities. They are so self-oriented that if the Holy Spirit had come into your personality the way it was at that time, you would simply have crucified this dear Holy Spirit within you because he is a sensitive, gentle person. And the strong drives for security and significance and success that govern so many of us would simply have throttled that sensitive spirit within us. It would be like someone playing one of the studies of Chopin and somebody else coming in with the 1812 concerto with cannon. That's, it would have been that kind of situation. The gentle, sensitive, little sound would have been utterly overwhelmed by the chaotic cacophony that was produced by our drives for security and significance and success. And so God could not make available the Holy Spirit to us until that self-oriented personality of ours was placed, you remember, into Jesus. And in a cosmic act of annihilation and recreation on Calvary, God destroyed that self-oriented personality in him, son Jesus. And from that moment on, God was able to make available the Holy Spirit to us. And so the Holy Spirit really is the purpose for whom Jesus, for which Jesus came. He came to give us the Holy Spirit. Now, loved ones, I think, you see, a lot of us don't really face that. A lot of you have listened maybe for months and years to this truth that your old self-oriented personality was destroyed in Jesus and you've entered into a kind of mental ascent to that. And you've said, that's good. I've been looking for a solution for years. That's good. That's the solution. Now I just have to believe that and I have to go out and live it. Loved ones, that is compounding the independence that you've already shown towards God. The truth is that the only purpose of your old self-oriented personality being destroyed in Jesus was so that you at last could submit to the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit is the only one who can actualize in you that cosmic act that took place on Calvary. 
He is really, loved ones. He is. You know, I really sympathize with those of you, you dear brothers and sisters, who have tried to make the miracle on Calvary real in yourselves. I know why you're doing it, and I tried it too, you know. You just keep thinking, if I can believe it enough, if I can believe it enough, it'll happen. And many of you have got yourselves into just the part of auto-suggestion, you know. I'm dead, I'm dead with Jesus, I'm crucified, I don't exist any longer as I used to be. I have to think positively, and if I can somehow will my mind to believe this strongly enough, it'll become real in me. Loved ones, don't you see you're taking the same line as all the heretics? Really? That's the way the heresies run. They say, the work was done on Calvary All I have to do is make it real in myself by believing it. And you know what it produces. It produces lots of people who run around saying, Ah, you're not believing it the right way. Come over. There was a fella came down to us, and he showed us the way to believe this. Now, a lot of us gathered together, and many of us in Utah, and we're gathered together, and we know just the way to believe this. Now, you're doing the best you could with the revelation you've got, but if you believe it our way, it'll become real in you. And, loved ones, there are hundreds of sects that are built on that corner on truth heresy. And it comes from thinking that by simple believing, we can make the miracle on Calvary real in our own lives. Loved ones, it isn't so. It really isn't. And, you know, lest you... Uh, cast your eyes uh, to Salt Lake City and forget our own mistakes, don't you see that that is present throughout Christendom? If you can only look at it our way, if you can see it our particular way, if you can grasp the corner on truth that we have, if you can believe what happened on Calvary just as we do, it'll take place in your life. And it has spawned the power of positive thinking, It has spawned Christian science. It has spawned so many of us who are just hard, hard fundamentalists in our minds. But it has never come to touch our lives. And we are simply mental believers. You hardly dare call us Christians. We're mental believers. We know what to believe. We know which party we should vote for in politics. We know which Bible we should believe. But there's little of the fragrance of Jesus or the evidence of the cosmic act on Calvary having been made real in our own lives. And of course, loved ones, the truth is that you do have to believe that we were destroyed in Jesus on Calvary. And that our old personality was completely recreated there. You do have to believe that. But the only way for that to be made real in us is by submission to this dear Holy Spirit. Truly, loved ones. Honestly, you do have to go to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I believe this. And I believe that it happened on Calvary. But my life is as if this has never taken place in history. My life is filled with self. My life is filled with self-orientation. I am not different from what I was when I first heard of this. Holy Spirit, will you lead me into the reality of this? And loved ones, only the Holy Spirit can do that. That's why the song goes, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. You trust, you believe with your mind that the work took place on Calvary, but then you begin to obey this dear Holy Spirit inside. And to do what he tells you, and then he makes the cosmic objective miracle real in your own subjective personal life. And that's the way it works, loved ones. And of course, there are heresies that have confused and perverted that obedience. And you know those too. There are those who come along and say, now if you'll do what we do, or if you live the Christian life as we say you should live it, then it will be real in you. And so that has spawned thousands of heresies who are bound by sheer legalism. But it has also brought about many of us inside Christendom who say, if you behave the way I behave, This will be real in your life. Or we do it even with 
the spirit-filled meetings. If you speak in tongues the way I speak in tongues, then it will be real in your life. If you experience the same thing as I have experienced, then it will be real in your life. And we make the obedience, obedience to a set of standards or norms. Loved ones, the obedience is to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a dear, blessed person. And he knows each one of you individually. Loved ones, he does. I, I love you. And I think you do know that. But I don't know you the way he knows you. He knows you better than your wife or your son or your daughter knows you. The Holy Spirit knows you intimately. And loved ones, he is going to customize the deliverance that took place on Calvary to you personally and for you personally. Really, really. That's why the Bible says, you know, no one can judge the spiritual man. Really. No one else can judge you. No one can say, ah, you want to be real in Jesus, then you ought to do what I do. You're not doing what I do, so you mustn't be real. No. No one can say that. No one can come along and say, you must be this way or you must be that way. The Holy Spirit will individually apply the cross of Jesus to you in ways that he will not apply it to anybody else. So just to tie it down, loved ones, somebody here, let's say, let's take a crude example. Two people here could be smoking. Uh, Really, uh, there's nothing terribly wild about smoking. It's just dumb, but there's nothing wild. (laughs) Well, I think that's right, isn't it? It's it's just dumb physically, you know. And uh, loved ones, I sympathize with the loved ones here who are just under the smoking thing, you know, because it's one thing to laugh at it, but it's another thing to just stand by your brother or sister and say... Oh, loved one, I I know it's hard for you. But there's nothing terribly sinful, it seems, about smoking, except that it's a sin against your own body, presumably. But let's say there are two people here this morning who smoke. The Holy Spirit could very well deal with one person on the smoking issue and deal with the other person on the gossip issue. Because the gossip thing is what is holding the Holy Spirit out of making Calvary real in that person's life. But it's the smoking issue that is declaring the rebellion in the other person's life. Now, that's what it means, loved ones. The Holy Spirit is able to make Calvary and the miracle and the deliverance of Calvary real in your life individually. So really, the important thing in receiving this dynamic of the Holy Spirit into your life is obeying that Holy Spirit. Whatever he's telling you. Uh, Joe Novak, I think I've quoted the, the quotation so often that he thought that I'd made it up and it wasn't in the Bible. It is in the Bible. Acts 5 and 32, God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey. That's in the Bible. And it's a verse, Acts 5 and 32. God gives the Holy Spirit to those who obey. Now, loved ones, that's true. That's true. Despite all of you who are looking up the Bible to change. <laughs> but that is really true. The Holy Spirit comes into your life if you begin just a little bit, just a little bit to respond to him. And the important thing is to respond to him about your own life. So, I, I, I really appreciate, you know, you loving me and trusting me But really, after my words are all said, you have to go to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, you alone can make the cross of Christ real in my life. Will you do it? I can't take what that man said or what this woman said or what my mother said or what my roommate said. Holy Spirit, will you show me where you want me to begin to obey? And then, Holy Spirit... Will you begin to make the miracle that took place on Calvary where my old self was destroyed and it was completely recreated? Will you make that real in me at this moment? And that's, loved ones, that's honestly the way to go, really. And for any progress in the Holy Spirit, you simply need to continue that. And so I'd really encourage you, by all means, to check what the Holy Spirit is saying to you against the Bible so that you don't end up following some spirit of error. By all means, check. The Holy Spirit who wrote this word is the one who is speaking to you. But above all, begin to commune with the Holy Spirit. 
And don't be afraid, loved ones. The Bible says the Lord is the Spirit. Really? The Lord is the Spirit. That's, uh, and it might be good for some of you to look that up because it's 2 Corinthians 3 and 17. 2 Corinthians 3 and 17. Because it is very easy for some of us to misunderstand the doctrine of the Trinity so that we think in some way we're being distracted from Jesus when we're told to attend to the Holy Spirit. But do you see it? It's page 1005. 1005. 2 Corinthians 3 and 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And you can see that the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Jesus, they are interchangeable terms. You, you'll find that in Acts, if you like to look at it, and uh, Acts chapter 16 and verse 6. Because you'll realize very quickly, loved ones, after reading a little of the book of Acts, that the Holy Spirit was the dynamic person who led the early church and told them what to do. After Jesus had left the earth, the Holy Spirit became their master here on earth. Acts 16 and verse 6. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the headquarters, or by the conference, or by a telegram. No, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guided them, you know, each step, to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come opposite Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. And obviously, you know, there's no difference made between the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Jesus. The two phrases are used to des designate the Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. But wherever the Holy Spirit is, of course, Jesus is. Because the Holy Spirit takes of the things of Jesus and makes them real to us. And that was the position that Jesus gave to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Jesus' successor. Now, you remember that occurs in John 16, loved ones, if you like to look at it, so that you receive it in Jesus' own words. He implied that he was going to dwell now with his Father in heaven and that the Holy Spirit was going to be him to us here on earth. And uh, so he says in John 16 and verse 12, uh, it's uh, recorded, page 940, John 16 and 12, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. So you have the picture of Jesus telling the Holy Spirit what to say to us. And the Holy Spirit coming down and saying it to us. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. Jesus assures us if we look to the Holy Spirit, you won't find the Holy Spirit drawing attention to himself. That's why when you get groups that are all preoccupied with the mighty works of the Holy Spirit instead of with Jesus, you know that a spirit of error has crept in there. Because the Holy Spirit, where he is followed and not an evil spirit, the Holy Spirit himself always draws attention to Jesus. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And the Greek verb means to share. He will take what is mine and he'll share it with you. So, loved ones, the only way you or I can ever experience the reality of God inside our own lives is to begin to listen to the Holy Spirit. And you remember that last Sunday I was protesting against many of the mental conversions that we have produced ourselves. We have produced them just by the exercise of our minds and our wills, independent of the Holy Spirit himself. In other words, some of us, you remember, I'll just throw it on the screen very briefly, but some of us have looked to the, the truth that came to us with our minds, and we've said, I believe what happened on Calvary. With our wills, we've tried to obey the things that we received through our minds, either from the Bible or from other people, or through our bodies from the people that we've met. So we've heard of God through a certain group of people, and they've fed us in these thoughts. And they've said, if you want to be real with God, then you must behave as we behave. And so we've received all this information, and we've exercised our minds about it, and we've exercised our wills. And so you get that hard kind of mental believer. 
that has little of the fragrance of Jesus or the dynamic of the Holy Spirit inside them. So, of course, when they come to the blast, there is nothing they can do. They're in the same position as the rest of mankind, trying to pull themselves out of their indolence or their depression by their bootstraps. Because really, they've experienced nothing supernatural because the work of the new birth and being baptized with the Spirit and filled with the Spirit occurs here in our spirits. And the only way for that to happen is for us to allow our conscience, which is part of the Spirit within us, to direct us. That's where the conscience may say to one person here, the smoking. That's the problem. The conscience may say to another person, the gossip. That's the problem. And if you respond with your will to that voice, loved ones, then you begin to experience the reality of God's Spirit and His dynamic within you. But if you start responding with your will to what all your friends think you should do or what you've read in books, then you'll experience nothing but a mental conversion or a reformation of character which really will not last and will have nothing real inside it. That's why some of us, do you see, who have become Christians run out of gas after three or four months or two years. Or the whole thing gets very dry and very hard. Because we either have not obeyed the Holy Spirit at the beginning, or, as the Galatians did, we started with the Spirit, but we ended with the flesh. And we started listening to the Holy Spirit, but now we've read so many books, and we've gone to so many meetings and so many conferences, that we're listening to everybody's opinion of what we should do. And long ago, we've got given up listening to this dear, gentle counselor who says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Loved ones, that's always it. That's always the way to the peace that God has for us. Listening to that dear counselor. And before you can listen to him, you must believe that he is. Loved ones, just very briefly, I, I'd like to show you some of the realities of it. And you know, some of you know the old house. Uh, from from last year, perhaps. And normally, the Holy Spirit begins this way. It's a very gentle, very natural thing. I'd really appreciate, loved ones, if somebody could get me scotch tape. Mark, I could tape that on. The Holy Spirit stands here, Revelation 3 and 20, and stands at the door and knocks. And normally... To anybody here who has not experienced anything of the dynamic of the Holy Spirit within them, he normally knocks on your door and inquires about some of the actions and words that that self is producing. And uh, he points to some of the actions in your life that are not right or some of the words. Thanks, man. And he points out, all right, uh, I want you to deal with those. And, loved ones, if you do deal with those, then the Holy Spirit comes into the house of your life. Now, if you don't deal with them, loved ones, there'll be no entrance of the supernatural Spirit of God into you. And you'll be left simply with that old human uh, reformation problem that is heavier to carry on your back than anything else. But if you do begin to deal with these actions and words that the Holy Spirit is pointing out, then he comes in and he opens up another area of your life. And he begins to point to some attitudes in your life. And he begins to deal with those. And loved ones, if you continue to let him deal with those attitudes, you'll find that the Holy Spirit will fill more and more of your life. And as you walk in the light, that's what's called walking in the light. You know, the Holy Spirit shines light down an attitude, says, will you deal with that? Will you allow that to be crucified on, on Calvary? And you say, yes, that's walking in the light. Uh, turning against the light is turning around and saying, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to recognize it. And once you do that, you fall back into the flesh again and into unreality. So he deals, first of all, in the office and... He comes there and points out some of the things that are there in your attitude to people in the office. And it varies with all of us. But the Holy Spirit will most certainly point to some of these things deep within. And he'll point to some of your pride and your work or 
that shows itself when anybody ever dares to criticize your typing or to criticize your decisions. Or he'll show you your love of praise when the boss forgets to thank you for a piece of work and you're all cast down and you you see that you do think there's something in you to be praised and you do see that there's something in you that is not willing to be crucified on a cross and to be ignored and despised and neglected and the Holy Spirit will deal with those things. And then he, he begins to come into the life that you have with your friends and comes into the entrance hall and begins to deal with some of the selfishness and some of the fear of people that's there. And he points out to you that if you're crucified with Christ and you've died to what people can do to you, why are you afraid of people? And you begin to sense, yeah, I am afraid of people because I do think they have power over me. I do think they can affect my job and I am afraid to lose my job. And then you begin to find that anything you're afraid of losing is a master and a domineering power over you. And the Holy Spirit begins to show you that, that there can be no freedom until you've really died to everything you have, until you're afraid of nobody and you're afraid of what no man can do to you. He comes into the bedroom and begins to deal with some of the attitudes that are there. And notice, loved ones, after you're born of the Spirit, normally it's an attitude problem. You know. Not many of you, if you claim to be born of the Spirit at all, not many of you came in here swearing at everybody else, you know. And not many of you came in tearing up the songbooks. No, most of us are very gentle, sophisticated creatures. Once we're born of the Spirit, we have at least enough power to keep those things down. And so normally, it's the attitude life that the Holy Spirit deals with. And of course, that's where thousands of us, you know, have missed the boat. Because we think, well, outwardly, in our acts and words, we're like Jesus. Well, this other thing, this will be dealt with over a long period of time. No, loved ones, no. After you clear out the dirt and the wrong and the evil spirits in a house, then you have to fill it with a beautiful spirit. And then that beautiful spirit has to spend 30, 40 years developing and growing. That's the growing part of Christianity. You don't grow out of this stuff. You are delivered out of this by being filled with the Holy Spirit and cleansed by the Holy Spirit. You do grow into beauty. You grow in beauty and Christ-likeness. You grow in new ways of showing patience. You grow in finer ways of showing gentleness. But you don't grow out of these things. These things you have to deal with honestly in the Holy Spirit in regard to Calvary. And the Holy Spirit deals with these things, deals with the worry. Why are you worried? Well, I'm worried because I... Don't think things will turn out right at the job tomorrow. Well, why do you not think that? Well, I, I'm in charge of that job and I don't know exactly what to do. You're in charge? Yeah, I'm in charge. Not God? No, me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then gets down another level and says then, uh, are you satisfied that God will bring it out right? And you say, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I am. Well, then why are you still worried? Well, I'm not sure that his right will be the same as my right. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit will take you down deeper, loved ones, and be, be content to go with him. Be content to travel with him. This is a dear friend, a dear counselor that will do a better job with you than Freud could ever do. Because the Holy Spirit can see underneath the depths that you and I cannot get to with all our introspection. And so he begins to deal, you know, with the family room, brings us in there where we live, because... You're getting near the heart of the problem when you begin to deal with the people you live closest to. That's where the self shows itself most. And the Holy Spirit begins to show you some of these things, point out to you that there's a real sense in which you're very concerned with yourself. You're very concerned about what way they treat you. You're very concerned with getting your way and things. And the Holy Spirit begins to point out to you that all anger had been cleansed from Jesus when he hung on the cross. And they spat at him and insulted him. And are you willing to drink of the same cup? Are you willing to stay there on that cross with no anger? And so the Holy Spirit begins to deal with these things. Then begins to go into the chapel or the prayer room, you know. Begins to show you the deadness and the dryness and the lack of power there. And you begin to sense, yeah, I'm still running a self-managed, self-initiated, self-directed religious life. 
I can see that the Holy Spirit is always new. He's always bringing new flowers in in the springtime. He's always bringing clean rain down the streets. He's always bringing brightness and light every morning when we get up. The Holy Spirit is always bringing cleanness and brightness and joy and happiness. Where there's deadness and dryness, I know he isn't having his way. And the Holy Spirit begins to show you that. Yeah, you don't pray when I want you to pray. You pray when you want to pray. You don't read the Bible when I want you to read the Bible. You pray when you want to read the Bible. This part of your life is no longer under my control. And then he begins to go into the lounge and begins to deal with some of the things that show themselves there in ordinary conversation, you know, and begins to deal with that love of ease, that feeling, if I just could rest, if I could just relax. And the Holy Spirit begins to show you that as Jesus walked down the Via Dolorosa, there could be no feeling of, if I could just relax, if I could just back off for a short time to get ready for this. But when the Holy Spirit is in charge of your life, It means you must be prepared to do what he tells you to do when he wants. Because that's, loved ones, going to be the crucial thing when we are used by God to redeem the whole universe. Then when God tells you to go to Mars, you'll have to go like that. You won't have a lot of time to think it over and consult with your friends. God has a lot of work and a lot of responsibilities for us uh, after this life. And he's training us for that. And that's why he wants us to be absolutely obedient to him. And then, loved ones, the Holy Spirit, and you know those of you who have watched it before, seems to have dealt with the whole deal. And then he starts knocking on a little door back here. And he knocks again and says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And you say, What more, Holy Spirit, could you want? I've given you everything. And then he says, Now, where did you put all that stuff that you took out of these rooms? And he discovers you have a back closet. And you just moved all the dirt and all the old furnishings right back into the back closet. And loved ones, that closet is exactly that. It's the feeling deep down, well, I let my anger go today, but I have the right to bring it back if I want to. Well, I let them despise me today and I let my pride be cleansed from me today, but I reserve the right to bring it back when I need it. That's it, loved ones. That's self. Self is not even all these attitudes. Self is the cause of all these attitudes. But at the heart, it's self's rights and self's ways that have to go to the cross and be destroyed. And the Holy Spirit is so good, he will never destroy them until you're really willing. Until you really say, yes, I'm willing For my rights and my own ways to be destroyed, I'm willing to be treated like Jesus on the cross. When you say that honestly, deep, deep down, loved ones, then the Holy Spirit cleanses your heart by faith and cleans your inside heart so that when it comes to those moments when you feel the blast coming, you know they're coming from outside and they're not coming from inside, and you find from within rises up a beautiful spirit of dynamic power and life that is the real you, because the old you has been crucified with Christ, and you can say, I was crucified with Christ, and I live, but not I, but Christ lives within me. And loved ones, for most of us, When that happens, when that closet is taken over, the Holy Spirit fills us or baptizes us with himself. And then the life in God under the control of his dynamic person, the Holy Spirit, begins. And that's the plan that God has for us. Loved ones, it's for you to deal with the Holy Spirit. You know, don't look at all this stuff and say, what a mess. You mean I have to be cleaned of all that before I go anywhere? Yes, but you don't do the cleaning. You just provide the willingness. You just say, Holy Spirit, yes. And if you're not sure what it means, you say, Holy Spirit, what does it mean to let go of my self-indulgence? And he explains, well, it means the next time you think you have a right to lie in bed a moment longer, you have no right. You accept that you have been crucified with Christ. You have no right to lie a moment longer. He'll explain it to you, loved ones. That's what Jesus said. The Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. And the way into freedom and liberty is by listening to that Holy Spirit. So, you know, 
Even looking at this today, even forget that. That's not important. It's not important what this poor little creature here puts on an overhead. What is important is the Holy Spirit, what he is saying to you personally. Because as you willingly allow him to come in and fill you, he will provide a dynamic in your life that will deliver you forever from that moment when you wonder, why bother? Really, loved ones. It is possible to come to the ground of that miserable old heart of yours. It is.